Hi students, welcome to the chapter 3 lecture on molecules. I hope you have all had success in viewing the lectures for chapters 1 and 2. Um, also just a little reminder, um, we have the introduction discussion board active on Blackboard. Um, refer to your syllabus as to the assignments that are due this week, but the introductory discussion board is up and active. Um, the roster verification quiz is also active and chapters 1 and 2 homework is also active. Um, so just make sure that you have all of those assignments in and we're moving on with week 2 material. This is chapter 3 molecules. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about organic molecules first. Again, your cells are around 70 to 95 percent water, depending on which specific type of cell we're talking about, but all cells are mostly composed of water, and the rest of the cell consists mostly of carbon-based molecules. So organic chemistry is the study of carbon compounds and these usually do not include carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. And here of course we have carbon from the periodic table. Remember the element symbol here is in the middle. We have the atomic number here which is equal to the number of protons and the mass number here which is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So carbon is a really versatile atom. It has four electrons in its outer shell that can hold up to eight electrons. So there's potentially four sites where carbon can interact with other atoms. It can share its electrons with other atoms to form up to four covalent bonds. So carbon can use its bonds in many different ways. These include attaching to other carbons. Um, it could form an endless diversity of carbon skeletons, such as these. And the simplest organic compounds are hydrocarbons. And as their name suggests, these are organic molecules that only contain carbon and hydrogen atoms. The simplest hydrocarbon is methane and hydrocarbons typically are very good fuel sources. So for example, we have octane, propane, and butane, as well as food molecules, such as the energy-rich parts of fat molecules. You've all probably heard that cattle are a big source of methane um, due to the fact that they have um, gut bacteria and protozoa that produce a lot of methane gas. The cows end up expelling that gas and it's actually a very um, significant source of greenhouse gas. So methane, while it is not as prevalent in our environment as a greenhouse gas, um, it's actually a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Okay, so on a molecular scale, many of life's molecules are gigantic. Biologists call these macromolecules. Macro, big molecules. And some examples of these macromolecules are proteins and DNA. Macromolecules are polymers, which are made by stringing together many smaller molecules called monomers. So mono means one, poly means many. When you take many monomers and attach them, they make up polymers, as shown here. And cells are going to link monomers by a process called dehydration synthesis. 
So when a, mo when a monomer is added to a polymer string, a water molecule is formed by the release of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. So you have here your monomer that's going to be attached to this short polymer here. It comes in with a hydroxyl group. There is an extra hydrogen atom on the end of this short polymer. What happens is those um, two groups combine to form a water molecule, and then you have added a monomer to your growing polymer. Organisms also have to break down macromolecules. So in our day-to-day -day lives, we do this whenever we eat. We take in proteins, fats, sugars, and we have to break those macromolecules down into smaller subunits that are usable by our bodies. Cells do this by a process called hydrolysis. Hydro refers to water, lysis means to break. This is essentially the reverse of a dehydration reaction. So water is actually added to this long polymer here. A hydroxyl group attaches to a section here, and a hydrogen attaches to a section here, and thus that long polymer is broken into two smaller pieces. There are four main categories of large molecules in cells. These are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. You may be familiar with at least three of these. Lipids are commonly referred to as fats. Of course, carbohydrates, abbreviated carbs, and proteins. These are all sources of dietary nutrition. And nucleic acids are the DNA and RNA molecules. So carbs, of course, include sugars and polymers of sugars. So in this picture here, the starch in this crepe, um, the sugars and starches in the apple slices, and then the sugars in the whipped cream are all carbohydrates. Monosaccharides are simple sugars. And some types of monosaccharides include glucose, which is produced by plants during photosynthesis and is a basic building block of many food chains, fructose, which is found naturally in fruit, and honey, which contains both glucose and fructose. The two trademarks of a sugar are several hydroxyl groups and a carbonyl group, which is a carbon atom doubly bonded to an oxygen atom. The monosaccharides glucose and fructose are what are known as isomers. This means that they each contain the same atoms, but their atoms are arranged differently. So here you can see glucose and fructose very similar. They have the same building blocks, but the structural arrangement differs. Monosaccharides are the main fuel that cells use for cellular work. So whenever your cell needs to repair itself or bring in large molecules from another cell or from the extracellular fluid outside of it, it needs energy to do those things, and it will use monosaccharides to accomplish that. Disaccharides are double sugars, and it's just constructed from two monosaccharides. So you have um, a glucose molecule here and a glucose molecule here coming together in a dehydration synthesis to form maltose, which is the double sugar.
The most common disaccharide is sucrose, which is common table sugar. It consists of a glucose linked to a fructose. Sucrose is commonly extracted from sugarcane and the roots of sugar beets. And the United States is one of the world's leading markets for sweeteners. This is, it sounds like a very shocking fact. The average American consumes about 100 pounds of sugar per year. Of course, that's not just from actual um, sugar like you see here. It's not just from eating raw cane sugar or powdered sugar. That would be pretty bizarre. <laughs> but of course, these sweeteners as well as high fructose corn syrup are commonly used in many different processed food products. Um, especially sodas and candy, so we end up consuming about 100 pounds of sugar per year on average. It's an interesting fact, but I'm always curious as to how many pounds of other major macromolecules we consume. Maybe it wouldn't sound quite so shocking if we knew how much protein, for example, or how much um, other forms of carbohydrates we all took in. Okay, moving on to polysaccharides, we're still within that one type of macromolecule, carbohydrates, but complex carbohydrates are called polysaccharides. They are long chains of sugar units, and they are polymers of monosaccharides. So a few examples here. We have cellulose making up these potato leaves here. We have glycogen within our own muscle tissue, and we have starch making up um, the starch in potatoes. A familiar example of a polysaccharide, of course, is starch. It consists of long strings of glucose monomers. Plant cells are going to be storing starch for energy and potatoes and grains are major sources of starch in the human diet. Animals store excess sugar in the form of a polysaccharide called glycogen. This is similar in structure to starch, yet more extensively branched. Most glycogen is stored in liver and muscle cells, which break down the glycogen to release glucose when you need energy. So you've probably heard of glycogen if you um, have gotten into a fitness routine or through physical education courses. We need to break that down in order to um, have usable energy while exercising. And cellulose is the most abundant organic compound on Earth. It's another polysaccharide. It forms cable-like fibrils in the tough walls that enclose plants. And it's a major component of wood. Celery, of course, has a lot of cellulose, which we cannot digest. I've actually heard that you burn more energy digesting, cel or digesting celery than you gain by eating it. I don't know whether or not that is true, though. This is also known as dietary fiber. So because we cannot break down cellulose, it passes through our digestive tracts unscathed and basically provides us with necessary fiber to keep our digestive tract healthy. These pronghorn antelope are a great example of animals that can break down cellulose. They're here in this alfalfa field in south central Oregon. So how do large animals like pronghorn antelopes and cows digest cellulose? Well, they have a little bit of help from their gut bacteria and protozoa. So these mammals have an interesting adaptation that we do not have. They have the bacteria and protozoa that can break down cellulose. Okay, I'm going to stop here and pick up in the next segment.